In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we enter into the happy work of opening your word today, we ask you to gift us with your Holy Spirit, so that as we examine the one who Luke is presenting to us, everything we say and everything we learn will bring glory to Jesus Christ, your Son, whom we proclaim gladly as Lord and Savior. In Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. All right, one little thing I want to mention. We have a new friend to our Bible study uh, that I met through an email this week. We're going to give a shout out to Lori in Albuquerque. She, she's watching with us on the little YouTube channel, all right? There's actually quite a number of people now around, but I told Lori we'd give her a shout out. So uh, she lives in Albuquerque. I don't know if they say hey, but I'd like you all to just say hey, Lori. Hey, Lori. All right, there you go. All right. Right, so last week we were in uh, chapter 6, got into chapter 6, and this is right after Luke gives us what I think is this genius line, this metaphor, that if we understand it, and I hope we unpack it a little bit, can really add so much to what he's trying to say in the chapters that follow. And that's where he quotes Jesus as saying, new wine must be put in new wineskins. All right, and I hope you remember kind of what that meant. Because it's the answer to the question, Jesus, why are you doing what you're doing the way you're doing it? You seem to be provoking so much unnecessary opposition and questions. You're not doing a very good job of marketing this new idea that you're presenting because you're doing a lot of things that people are running away from. Well, the answer to that question is he's trying to develop the new wineskins for the new wine. All right, And I hope as we go forward that you can see how that applies over and over and over again. Last week we already got into chapter 6 and we saw how uh, Jesus and his disciples were hungry on a Sabbath day going through a cornfield. He allowed them to pick some corn and eat it. And the Pharisees that were there complained, why are you doing this? Now in a lot of places he combines what he teaches with a miracle. He doesn't do that here. But he does kind of blunt try to blunt the, the tip of the spear of criticism by saying, look, in, your, in the scriptures, you remember when David and his followers ate the showbread, which was allowed only for the Levites and the priests to eat, but he ate it. The superstar of ours ate it, and you made an allowance for him because he wasn't a Levite, but he did that thing, obviously broke the Mosaic law, but you allowed for it. He says, I'm telling you, you already have exceptions. Now that probably didn't satisfy them because the, the response probably was, yeah, but that was David. I was King David. Well, it was before he was king. But that was David. Who are you? And then he says, the son of man is master of the Sabbath. I know that probably didn't satisfy them that much, right? Before we go forward, let me, let me just frame where we're at this way. Jesus is in Galilee. And there's a reason for that. Galilee is far away from Judea and Jerusalem. Up in Galilee, there are some Pharisees, there are some priests, there are some Romans, but there's not that many of them. All right? The hotbed of those groups that gives him the most opposition is in Jerusalem. All right? So that's a good place for him to be. In fact, that was a good place for all rebels to be. Josephus tells us that in this time, most of the rebellions that arose came from Galilee. Because up in the hills, country where there weren't as many Romans, they could get together and form a band of either being thieves and rebels or maybe trying to lead a revolution. And as, as in so many situations, they consider themselves freedom fighters and the Romans consider them terrorists. Right? Depends on which side of the argument you're on. In the Revolutionary War, the Minutemen, to us, were freedom fighters. What were they to the British? They were terrorists. Right. We have the same thing in the Middle East now. A lot of people that we're saying these terrorists, how can anybody support them? Well, it's because they think they're freedom fighters. Right? It just depends on which side of the equation you're on. So up in Galilee, these groups would arise from time to time. Josephus tells us, tells us there was one he calls Judas the Galilean, not one of our Judases, but another Judas the Galilean, 
who rose up and had some local success. And the Romans finally had to put together a big enough contingent to go up there into the hills, rout him out, sniff him up, round his people up, and exterminate them. All right, so Galilee was suited for this because it was in the outer regions of the centers of power. Jesus had trouble with Pharisees and later on with Romans. They had the power to kill him. That's why he didn't go to Jerusalem until he had accomplished his purpose, which was to gather at least enough believers. A small group, maybe they didn't understand everything, but a small group that had not walked away yet. And when he decided, okay, I've got enough now, now we'll go to Jerusalem. And his apostles are going to say, no, don't go to Jerusalem. They're going to kill you there. Because they may have been thinking, probably were, like probably a lot of these other people who are willing to accept him on their terms, that he was going to be a warlord. That Messiah was going to be a general and a king who was going to organize an army, probably in Galilee, and eventually take back Israel. They were interested in political freedom, to have a nation that had military dominance in the world, and they wanted the real estate back. That had been taken from them. So the people that are attracted to this miracle-working prophet, by and large, were looking for that. And Jesus, so he has the Pharisees who oppose him because he breaks the Mosaic law, and to them he's trying to get across, look, you love the law, but you don't love the ones the law was trying to make you love, which is God and your neighbor. You understand? You got it wrong. And very few of them converted. We know about Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, maybe a few others, but there weren't many. Right? But then he has the other group who maybe weren't that interested in keeping Mosaic law to perfection. Probably they didn't either. The great unwashed, the everyone else that's in Galilee. But he had problems with them too because they were attracted to him, but they thought those that were beginning to be open to him being something more than just a prophet, maybe the Messiah, the prophet, had a wrong idea of what he was going to do. So he's trying to get it across to them too, and he had to disappoint them over and over and over again. He will do that here, all right? So he's trying to deal with all of these different types of oppositional groups, just chipping away to try to find at least a few that were open to what he was really trying to do and be. So that's what, he's, that's what he's doing right here. And as he says these hard to understand things, he's doing the best he can to make it, to soften them up by accompanying it with the signs, the miracles. Okay, we saw that. We've already seen him forgive sins. And the Pharisees say, he must be from the devil. Only God can forgive sins, right? But the other people saying, yeah, but he just healed a paralytic. Maybe we should listen to him a little longer, right? So that's kind of typically the way it came out. All right. After eating the corn on the Sabbath, it goes on. It says, now on another Sabbath. <laughs> oh, can't we do it on a Monday, Jesus? Uh, on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue. I'm in verse 6 of, of chapter 6. And a man was present, and his right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him, See if he would cure somebody on the Sabbath, hoping to find something to charge him with. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and stand in the middle. Look, he could have said to the guy, Look, I'm going to heal you. You've had this withered hand all your life, a few more hours. Can you just wait till the sun goes down? It's not Sabbath anymore. I'll heal you, and then we won't have to deal with the thing that's going to happen if I do it right now. But he didn't do that. Obviously because he wanted to provoke the question. He wasn't afraid of the controversy. So on the Sabbath, in the synagogue, he asked the man, not in secret, but come out in the middle. Right. In front of everybody. And he said, I put it to you, is it permitted on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And they don't answer. That's a hard question. Because they want to be against him. And they understand here, anything I say, I'm going to be stuck. So they don't answer him. Kind of exasperated. Then he looked round at them all and said to the man. Looks around to them all and said to the man. Now, in other words, are you all watching? Paying attention. 
stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was restored. Now, were these people ecstatic that one of their own had been healed of this terrible affliction? No. It says, but they were furious. And they began to discuss the best way of dealing with Jesus. They were furious. He had done a good deed, a kind thing, restored one of their own community who had this withered hand, whatever that was, from. And then, but he did it on the Sabbath. They might have been scared of him. They might have been scared of him. Yeah, because, I mean, he could do miracles, right? Yeah. And plus the people, there were a lot of people that were on his side. They didn't know what to do with him. They didn't know what to do with him, but they, know that they wanted to do something with him. We can't have this. He's just breaking the law. And he's saying things like, the Son of Man is Master of the Sabbath. What does that mean? He's the Son of Man. He has Master of the Sabbath. What does that mean? Right? All we know is he's breaking the Sabbath. And we can't have that. We can't have a lawbreaker. You've got to keep the rules. Now, Jesus is not against the rules. He would say, the law of Moses was given for a reason. But what he's trying to say is, the reason was to quarantine you, shut you off, bring you in, protect you from the outside world. That's the old wine. And the Mosaic Law was the, was the old wine skin. What he's trying to say now is I'm bringing a new power, the grace of God, the indwelling Holy Spirit, into the world that my, the new people of God in the new covenant are going to go out. And they're now going to have the empowerment by God to take back from time and space and, the, and in the minds of hearts of people what belongs to God but which has been stolen from him by the enemy. To sin and Satan, it's now time to take it back. And I'm trying to demonstrate to you there's going to be a new way of doing religion. There's going to be new wineskin for this new wine because it can't contain it. All right? Because I don't want you to consider yourself quarantined people who are huddling down hoping not to be noticed by the enemy. I want you to rise up. I want you to go back and go into the enemy's camp and take it back. When I said time and space, because that's going to include the Sabbath. The new day of worship is going to be Sunday. What's the significance of Sunday? The day he rose. And we know from Acts that right after the resurrection, the Lord's Supper and the worship service of the new covenant people was being held on the first day of the week, the day of the sun. Now to the Romans, that day was given over to a false god, the god of the sun, right? Also, to the Jews, that was the day of God's rest, remember? So there's a lot of levels here. On one level, to the Jews, the new people of God is being, in, is being invited into God's rest. Seventh day which means covenant. Okay? But also to the world, it means this day that's been given over to this false deity, we're taking back. It's time and place. The early church would commonly, when, when an area became converted, they would tear down the pagan temple and build a church right on it. Now, some people who want to criticize the church are not friends of the church would say, well, see, what they're trying to do is just continue pagan worship in this new way. You know, like, for instance, Christmas Day, December 25th, was put on the day they said one of their false gods was born. So, oh, they're just trying to, they're just put, trying to put new names on this pagan worship. But no, no, that's, that's wrong thinking. They're trying to take back what belonged to God. Real estate, this is not, this real estate is not for a pagan temple. This belongs to God. So we're going to tear it down and build a church right on top of it. We're going to make holy days. We're going to put them right where there used to be days that they would celebrate pagan worship. We're taking it back. You understand? It's all part of that. Right, establishing the kingdom of God. Not trying to find something that's not already being used and just fit in and hope we survive. But go back and aggressively take it. Alright? It's by force, but it's, it's what uh, Bishop Brown calls provocative nonviolence. 
It's very forceful nonviolence. Jesus is going to be extremely forceful in coming against evil, but he's going to do it by suffering crucifixion. They don't understand this. They think we're going to take up weapons and we're going to slay the Romans. He's going to say, no, I'm going to allow the Romans to crucify me. And my blood dropping on the earth is going to be the most powerful weapon against evil evil has ever seen. My blood dropping onto the ground is going to claim the ground, claim creation, claim earth back from my father. That's what I was sent to do. But I'm no coward. I'm, no, I'm not timid. But I don't need weapons. I'm going to stand here in a bravery and a groundedness they cannot remove even if they take my life. And in doing that, release into the world the grace and the power to convert them all, even those that are now your enemies. Provocative nonviolence. And we're going to see that in the Beatitudes, which we get to today. That's what he's going to teach the people. At least that's one level of teaching what's there. Okay. The next section in chapter 12, he goes up onto the mountain to pray, probably Mount Eremos, which I, in my invisible map, I showed you where that was last week, right? Spent the whole night in prayer. Isn't that interesting? The next day, after praying all night, I guess he had a consultation with God and he was convinced which one of these people that had come to follow him closely and where he went were going to be the 12 apostles. Special amongst the group of disciples. Why 12? Tribes of Israel. The tribes of Israel. He's the new Moses. Okay. He's the new Moses. So there are 12 leaders. And he's going to prophesy later on that in my kingdom, in heaven, you will sit and judge the 12 tribes, right, of Israel. Did he not, even though he's talking new wine, new wine skins, here he's speaking 12. Hang on, Missy. We almost forgot our new normal, right? What? I'm going to get you a microphone. Oh, blast. Yeah, blast. <laughs> Just forget it. Ignore it, even though it's bright pink. <laughs> Did he not? Thank you. Regardless of the new wine and the new wine skins, did he not connect... Like in other places, he talked about grafting into the root. He's not throwing the whole um, Israel. No, up. no, no, no. He says they have been the special people of God, are and will always be. The invitation is for them okay. first. So he's but it's also for everyone else. And that's the part they didn't like. That's the new part. That's the new part. So, it's more expansive in scope than they ever imagined in many ways including who is invited in. Okay? So no, he's not rejecting them. He's inviting them first. His deepest heart, just like Paul says, I would, I would rather be condemned myself it would, if it meant I was able to convince them that I love and that God loves to accept the Messiah for who he really is and what he really came to do. All right? That, right. That's right. All right, so he chooses the twelve. Simon, who he called Peter, and in the list of apostles, Peter's always first. Okay, And his, his brother, Andrew, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, called the zealot, Judas, son of James, that probably should be brother of James, James the lesser, and Judas are sons of Alphaeus. Um, we usually call Judas the son of Alphaeus Jude. That's Saint Jude. Because being named, being, being named Judas being named Judas ended up not being a very cool thing, right? So we ca started calling him Saint Jude. Yes, sir? So I wanted to ask um, why you thought that maybe the Jews uh, are so Well, two reasons. Number one is they're human. And there's still a lot of stiff-necked people that despite the truth that's being spoken to them won't accept it, right? Number two, in Jesus' time, the Jews were trained by what they had been taught for hundreds of years. 
They were a product of the worldview, the mindset, including what the Messiah would be, that they had been taught from those they trusted to teach them. So they, they had been taught that the Messiah would be for them. And look, that would be the natural response if a people had been conquered and subjugated by foreigners for hundreds of years. You know, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Seleucids, and now the Romans. It, like, you know, come on. I'm not feeling like the special people of God. Right? We're feeling like a bunch of slaves almost back in Egypt again. So they've been taught, no, the day is coming. That's going to be over. Isaiah prophesied it. We talked about that, you know. The day is coming. And it's all going to be restored. The problem is what they thought it was going to be restored to. Right? And they were thinking in terms of real estate and political freedom. Instead of going back all the way to what it was restored to in the primordial creation, the Garden of Eden, restored back to where all people have a right standing with God. The price will have been paid, not just for the sins of Israel, but for the price, the sins of all mankind, right? And that that blessing, that Messiah, would come out of Israel. And that's first and foremost what made them the special people of God. It's to Abraham that promise was given. But they had concentrated on the other promises, which are the ones that I've been describing. And they're steeped in that. And they had lost this idea that they were supposed to lead the whole world into right standing with their creator and the Lord God again. And that's what Messiah would do. The whole, I mean, they didn't necessarily think Messiah was going to be God. Probably thought he was going to be a divinely inspired great prophet or warrior or king, even greater than David and Moses. But they wouldn't say David or Moses was God. So even those that are willing to accept Jesus as Messiah, when he starts saying things like, I am the son of God, that's when they rip their garments over because that's the ultimate blasphemy okay so that's that's the problem because human beings are stiff neck and uh, we are fortunate to have been raised at least having heard the gospel as the presumed truth most of us in our life we haven't we don't have to get over hundreds of years or our whole lifetime full of wrong thinking from people that we respect thank God Okay. All right, he's picked the apostles. The crowds followed Jesus. He then came down from the mountain and stopped at a piece of level ground. Now in Matthew, he's going to give the Beatitudes on the mountain. Luke says he's given it on a plane somewhere. Don't have a problem with that. This is the Magna Carta of the church. This is the Magna Carta of the New Covenant people of God. Jesus probably gave this sermon in some form often. I don't know if you've watched any of these rallies that Trump does, but he says the same thing every day. And it's even broadcast on television. So, I mean, but Jesus didn't have that advantage. When he, when he gives this important foundational teaching here and he goes somewhere else, he's got to give it again because they haven't heard it. All right, so this is one of the places he gives it. He came down, stopped at a piece of ground, and there was a large gathering of disciples with a great crowd of people from all parts of even Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region. All right, so his fame's getting out there. Now when he, word gets out, he's going to teach tomorrow at a certain spot. People come and they want to hear it. At some point, I'll bet you a lot of them said he's going to start explaining the strategy. When he looks around, he says, man, there's thousands of us here. Men and women, but you know, in a few years, probably 10,000 men of fighting age, he'll arm us, and that's when, the, that's when the game begins, man, right? So they're coming out to hear it. First thing he did, what he always does, he, people tormented by unclean spirits were cured. He cured people of all their diseases. And everyone in the crowd was trying to touch him because power came out of him. That cured them all. They could feel the power. And Jesus wanted to give that and that experience first. Because what he's going to say next is going to trouble them. Alright, so before I get started, and you all get all itchy and antsy and everything, I'm going to cure a couple hundred people, 
cast out demons, and you all here, even if you're not possessed or sick, are going to feel the power that's emanating from me. All right? Now sit down. I want to talk to you. <laughs> and this is when he gives what Luke calls his first sermon, the Beatitudes. Beatitude means happiness or contentment. You could also almost say this is a sermon on how to be happy regardless attitude. To be happy no matter what attitude. Okay? And it says that because, well, my, my version says how blessed are you, but it might say how happy are you? Happy are you? Does anybody, anybody have that in there? Yeah. Happy are you? Okay, right. The attitude, happiness. All right, now, let me tell you this. There's two ways, two ways I want to look at this. One is it theologically, and I'll use Thomas Aquinas for that. Thomas Aquinas says what the Beatitudes are trying to tell us is that all those things in this life that make us happy. You might have friends. You might have a loving family. You might have health. You might have some money in the bank. Those things make us happy. They do. Make me happy. All right? I feel happier with them. Right? But what St. Thomas Aquinas says, Jesus is trying to get across, is that's not the deepest, most profound way to experience happiness. If you're stripped of those things, if you suffer, or you're persecuted, or you're poor, or you're grieving for your loved ones, or your youth, or your health, or your status, or your job that's been taken away, happy are you? Because you have a divine, unique opportunity now that you wouldn't have when you had those things to find your happiness in what's left, which is Jesus Christ. He's saying in that crucible of pain, we have an opportunity to ground our well-being and our happiness now on, the, on what's left and the only thing that will never be taken away, which is Jesus Christ. And in doing that, we find out as long as I have Jesus, I have everything I need. And that there is a strength that comes from that then that can allow you to stand up and do things you couldn't before when you're based on temporal happiness things, all right? You can forgive. You can give away. You can be humiliated. Because all those things don't take away what's most important to you. They can't. That's why it gives you such a strength for this provocative nonviolence, right? I can give and give and give to you, whether it's forgiveness or mercy or compassion or understanding or patience or money, because I'm not happy because of those things. All right? That's what, he's trying to, that's what he's trying to tell these people. So Thomas Aquinas says this is the way many saints found their relationship with God most strongly. A lot of them realized, a lot of them of means when they, when they came converted to the Lord, gave it all away. Not all, but a lot of them did. When Jesus saw the young man that came to him that was wealthy that time, remember? And he says, what must I do to be saved? And he says, keep the commandments. He says, I've already done that. And Jesus looks at him and says, if you want to be perfect, you know what you need to do? You need to give away all your money. Because what's standing between you and the love you need to give God alone is something you love a little bit more than you love God. And that's your money. So for you, you need to give it away. He doesn't say that to everyone. All right, because it's not money. Money is morally neutral. It's neither good nor bad. It's how you feel about it and what you do with it. And you don't even have to be wealthy to have a misplaced love for money. Some people who have no money at all, their entire life is based on getting it. Even to the point that I'll steal, I'll be greedy, I'll do dishonest things to get some money. So money's still got a hold on them, even though they don't have it. So it's the love of money. What you love the most is your God. And if you love your bank account and God's number two or three or four, you know, what's the old saying? If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Your God is the thing that's at the top of the love pyramid, <laughs> your priority pyramid. So for some people, that's it. And some saints realize that. Says, you know what's standing in the way? Others felt like it was their pride. They had to be humiliated. They would, they would live in the streets. They would wear 
you know, sackcloth from ashes. They would go to places where they figured they were going to be persecuted. They understood they had, I have to mortify the flesh, flesh not because I, I'm, I'm, I'm a masochist, but because that's, I realized for me that's what's standing in the way. And that's what Thomas Aquinas says, the fundamental lesson is in these Beatitudes. But now, the other way of looking at it, and I want you to be one of these right now. I want you to be a Galilean. Maybe not a beggar in the street, but somebody working hard to make a living. Being taxed heavily by the Roman government. You had no rights. No rights. You were totally under control of, these, of, these, of an opposing force. And here's this one that you think might be the one who's going to rise up and lead you into freedom. Somehow. And you're gathered here. He's displayed all this power, which is thinking, yeah, man, if we could get that on our side, nothing could stop us. Even if we're outnumbered or outgunned, we got this power. I felt it. You know, just, let's go. Got, a, got the ultimate weapon here. All right, now you're one of them. You're sitting here. You're very pleased. You've seen Jesus do all this stuff. And now he's going to talk to us. He says, blessed are you who are poor. The kingdom of God is yours. And you go, yeah. He says, blessed are you who are hungry now. You shall have your fill. Yeah! Blessed are you who are weeping now. For you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and drive you out and abuse you and denounce your name as criminal. criminal. Blessed are you. And he's going, yes, because that's exactly what they've been going through. Okay? Rejoice when that day comes and dance for joy. Look, your reward will be great in heaven. This was the way they, their ancestors treated the prophets. Uh, wait a minute. What? But then he gets back to the amen stuff. Alas for you who are rich. You are having your consolation now. Yeah. Alas for you who have plenty to eat now. You shall go hungry. I like it. Alas for you who are laughing now. You shall mourn and weep. He said, now you're doing it, Jesus. Now. All right. Yeah, baby. You, you are. Right there. Alas for you when everyone speaks well of you. This was the way their ancestors treated the false prophets. But he doesn't stop. Now he says, but I say this to you who are listening. Love your enemies. What? Do good to those who hate you. What? You are really falling off the rails now, right? Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who treat you badly. Jesus, stop it. To anyone who slaps you on one cheek, publicly humiliates you. Present the other cheek as well. To anyone who takes your cloak from you, the thief, do not refuse your tunic. Give to everyone who asks of you. Do not ask for your property back from someone who takes it. Are you kidding me? Treat others as you would like people to treat you. Well, wait a minute. If you love those who love you, what credit can you expect? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit can you expect? For even sinners do that much. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to get money back, what credit can you expect? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. Instead, love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend without any hope of return. But then he says, you will have a great reward. Wait a minute, I thought there was no return. You will have a great reward. And you will be children of the Most High. For he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. I don't like that. Right? I like the reward stuff. Finally, he didn't talk about just give it away and just, just to think of give it away. He's kind of saying, there's... You won't get it. Be willing to not have it back and you will be rewarded. But he's saying from God, right? right? Blessings will come to you. Be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. In Leviticus it says, be perfect as your God is perfect. Be holy as your God is holy. He's using that formula here and he says something else. Be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. Or maybe it says merciful. Merciful. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Hmm. 
Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Hmm. Give and there will be gifts for you. There's that reward. And in fact, he says it's a full measure. Pressed down, shaken together and overflowing will be poured into your lap. Because the standard you use will be the standard used for you. All right, crowd. Mixed emotions. I like part. I have parts I really don't like. I'm all, you want me to be generous? And you're saying God's going to give back to me so much it's going to be overflowing. I kind of like that, but I'd still like to get my other stuff back too. <laughs> this is pretty hard for me to process, right? That, and that bit about be merciful. What do we say in the Our Father? Forgive, forgive us as we forgive others. others. What does that mean? It means forgive us to the extent, in the same way, that we forgive others. You put it that way, you might not want to pray it as robustly. Right? I mean, do you want to be 50% forgiven? 90% except for the really bad stuff? We said, have you forgiven everyone? I said, yeah. Everyone that needs to be forgiven. There are a few people who, I mean, even God doesn't like them and they were so mean to me. There are them. I'm looking forward to the day that I see them thrown into the pit of hell. Well, laugh my belly off, right? No. You will be forgiven. If you want mercy, be merciful. You will be forgiven. So we ask God to forgive us. He says, in what way? I'll tell you what. I'll forgive you the same way you forgive others. For almost everything. That's a hard word, guys. I mean, they, have, they were having a hard time with what you're saying, but really, it's hard for us too. Because people are able to do mean things, cruel things, terrible things. And many of you have experienced that kind of treatment in your life. But listen, freedom comes in the forgiveness. When we forgive, we don't really do anything for the other person so much. What we're doing is cutting the rope of that piano we've been pulling behind us by hanging on to bitterness and unforgiveness. It sets us free. Jesus is telling us to do that to set us free. Unforgiveness, just like the love of money, occupies a place in our heart that Jesus wants to inhabit. And when we get that out of there, we can contain more of the love He wants us to have. You gotta wait on the microphone. It's a brief. It's a. This is gonna cut off all questions from here on forward, right? No, just forget it. Just ignore it. All right, go ahead. When we ask for forgiveness and we are supposed to forgive someone, do we have to associate with those people that we have forgiven? <laughs> well, no. So I, no, I would say no because sometimes, well. Let me, let me guess what you mean by associate. Sometimes it's very wise to stay away from them. Because they may still be a rattlesnake. I mean, let's face it, right? You're not expected to put yourself in danger unnecessarily, right? There's another thing here, too. The forgiveness he's talking about, the mercy, is not an emotion. You don't have to suddenly wake up feeling warm and cuddly towards this person that's done so much damage to you. Forgiveness begins with an act of our will. We make a decision to do it. The emotions, the sentiment come along later. Maybe many years later. And if being around that person evokes the opposite, if it reignites bad feelings, then just for spiritual hygiene, you probably should not go out of your way to put yourself in that position. And then one morning if you wake up and you say, I really don't hate that person anymore. Then you've won. But I think I, I don't think we can say, well, when I wake up and I don't have those bad feelings, then I'll forgive them. I don't think we ever get there. It's, it's, it begins with an act of the will, a decision. Okay? And then we have to be prudent as far as re, the active, ongoing, lived relationship with that person from now on. Alright? We forgive them. Sometimes that may have to, that may have to take the form of in-person talking or letter or telephone. That person may be dead. Do I have to say I forgive you? 
I, I ask a question between you and the Lord. That's right. You have to do it in your heart. I've done it in my heart. All right. I've done it in my heart. Well, I can tell you in my own life, I, I had some issues with my father for years. And I felt like I needed to forgive him. And I would have liked to have gotten off with just doing it in my heart. But that's not what the Lord told me to do. I, I felt like if this is going to be real, I have to put it in action. So we had a simple conversation one day. And I basically just said, forget the past. Let's go forward with a new normal. You don't owe me anything. That's all it was. That's all it was. And it totally changed our relationship. I've told you the story. Some of you, I told you the story before. I, he, he died a few years ago, and the last conversation we had was just me and him at the hospital room. And he said, I love you, son. I love you, dad. I gave him a kiss, and he died. That's a miracle compared to what it would have been a few years before that. All right? Well, I don't think I can do that. All right. I, I'm the, yeah. I'm not telling you that's what you have to do. I'm saying that's between you and God. Let me give you a scenario. I'd like you to... I'd like to present a scenario because, yes, I'd like to forgive uh, people who have sinned against me or who are, who are doing things wrong against me. This is a scenario. You live with someone in the same compound. Now, he goes and cuts your tires. You, you have a conversation with that person. And you, you forgive him. You say, don't do this again. He says, I'll not do it again. You buy new tires. Put on your car. Within two weeks again, he goes and costs the same tires in your car. You forgive him again. Then you buy a new set of tires again. Put in your car. He goes and costs them again. And he does not accept your forgiveness. What do you do with that person? Well, it sounds like he's taking your forgiveness as a show of weakness. And he's decided to continue. Now, this is very difficult when you have to defend a position on the worst possible scenario somebody can think of. <laughs> but, uh, all right, but let's say this. You need to do what you need to do to protect your, your tires. Just, but we're not called to hate, even as we do that. We're allowed to defend ourselves as a country, as a family, as people. The mandate is don't hate. Don't hate. That's, that's part of the problem not part of the solution. As much as we can, we try to uh, 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 maybe understand where this person's disorder or meanness comes from. Maybe ask God to be merciful towards his soul, even though he might need to go to jail to protect you and the public. But in his case, that's not, that's not an act of hate. It's just justice. Mm -hmm. All right? I mean, we need to resist terrorists and invaders and the whole bit, like, for instance, what's going on in Nigeria right now. You don't roll over to Boko Haram. You have to defend yourself. But as much as you can, you don't hate. And as much as you can, once hostilities are over, you work towards reconciliation. And you hope and believe that in the power of God, even that is possible at some point. Though in the midst of it, emotionally, it is impossible. Emotionally, it is impossible. But we can still make decisions to obey the gospel, even if our emotions are too humanly affected to come along right now. Okay? George. Hate what they do and not what they Hate what they do and don't hate who they are, or how or ver the right version of that. Hate the sin, not the sinner. Before you get to hate, Lord forgive, not forgive. But sometimes we provide them. You know, we provide them. It includes pinpointing them as good and the bad actions do. The first time you might see his face. Oh, man, I don't want to see his face again. Right. When you do this stuff, it means, isn't this the way to hate? Those little stuff that cascade? Um, you have to know yourself, and you have to handle the situation, the practicalities of what you can handle, depending on how the Lord leaves you. But it begins with making a decision to forgive and not hate. That's all he's saying, right? That's all he's saying. Be merciful. Try not to judge. And if you do judge, don't send, don't send everyone necessarily to hell. Hope, even, eat, hope for restitution even for them. And in your doing this, then Jesus has promised God will be merciful to you. That's all he's saying here, really. The Bible, the day Jesus died, he 
said it, and just as vital today. He, he started this sermon by saying, blessed are you if you do these things. He almost ends up saying, but you're in trouble if you do these other things. There's both sides are there, right? Alright, so that's, that's the beatitude of the Sermon on the Mount. He also told them this parable, which follows with it and some of the thinking we were happening, we were, we were talking about. Can one blind person guide another? Surely both will fall into a pit. Disciple is not superior to teacher. But fully trained disciples will be like the teacher. Okay, well, Jesus is going to show them through radical action what he wants them to imitate. It begins with him washing their feet, what began really with the incarnation. God condescending in love to become one of us. All right, washing our feet at the Last Supper and then be willing to be killed, tormented and killed by those who hate him but whom he loves and who he's trying to save. He's the teacher. And he says the disciples should be trying to be like the teacher. And he says this, Why do you observe the splinter in your brother's eye and never notice the great log in your own? Some of that Middle Eastern hyperbole, but it really... So, well, he's got the log. I, I, don't, I don't got no log. That's a splinter. It looks like a log to me. He says, well, objectively speaking, maybe your offenses are worse than his. Why do you observe anything that's wrong with his eye when you've got work to do? You know, you're the one that needs to get to the optometrist. Okay? Instead of criticizing everybody else's eyes. He goes on to say, how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take that splinter out of your eye when you cannot see the great log in your own. Hypocrite, ow. Come on. I like you calling people hypocrites, but not me. Take the log out of your own eye first, and then you will see clearly enough to take out the splinter from your brother's eye. There is no sound tree that produces rotten fruit, nor again a rotten tree that produces sound fruit. Every tree can be told by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorns or grapes from brambles. Good people draw what is good from the storeness of goodness in their hearts. Bad people draw what is bad from the store of badness. For the words of the mouth flow out of what fills the heart. What you say and what you do is a product of your inner attitude towards God. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Do not do what I say. Why do you say I'm the boss? Why do you say you're in command? And then don't do what I say. Here's... What Jesus is insisting on is believers coming to him on his terms. Right? Even the hard things. He doesn't back away. He's speaking it because it's truth. This is not a democracy. 51% of what the people want is not the truth, necessarily. If it's 99 to 1, the 1 could be right. And the truth resides there. Jesus is willing to let people walk away, even though he's saying, please, if you have ears to hear, listen. Look past your preconceived notions. Remember the power. Remember the miracles you just saw. Stay open at least a little bit to what I'm saying. Even the hard things. Just <coughs> don't turn away. Don't, don't reject yet. That's all he's trying to do. A lot of people would say the Catholic Church today would have a lot more converts if we change our teaching on a few things. A lot of talking heads on television were all excited when Pope Francis was made Pope. Finally, we're going to get some updated changes on these controversial issues. Like the new Pope isn't going to be Catholic or something. But the church was not given the mandate to become as popular as she can possibly be no matter what. and Therefore, be as clever as you can to package what you preach in terms of what the world wants to hear. Any more than Jesus did. Jesus taught the truth. He established a church and gave his teaching to the church and said, teach that. And at the end, he said at one time, at the end, when I come back, will there be anybody? He said that at one time. There may be, the world may not like what you're trying to sell. 
or give away. The numbers may get small. For a lot of reasons. But he says, I want you to persist in preaching the gospel as faithfully as you can. And we haven't even done that well. There's been a lot of corruptions of the truth Jesus gave us. A lot of ministers in our day who have corrupted the witness of the church. But they haven't damaged the message. But the messenger was definitely did harm, right? You know what I'm talking about. But that was the mandate. And we're supposed to struggle forward and pass that on the generations as faithfully as we can uh, and in a way that as many will stay as possible but in the end it's not a game of numbers hard work but that's exactly what Jesus is doing why do you call me the boss why do you call me the great authority why do you call me Lord Lord and do not do what I say everyone who comes to me verse 47 of 6 and listens to my words and acts on them. I will show you what such a person is like. Such a person is like the man who when he built a house, dug and dug deep and laid the foundation of raw rock. And when the river was in flood and it bore down on that house, but could not shake it, it was so well built. But someone who listens and does nothing is like a man who built a house on soil. Your version may say sand with no foundation. And as soon as the river bore down on it, it collapsed, and what a ruin that house became. Did he say guy number two didn't have a house? He had a house. It was just a house that couldn't stand when life happened. Jesus is saying the way to have a foundation, or use another met metaphor, if you want to have deep roots that can weather the storms, that comes from action. Saving Faith is faith in action. It's not just words. I would say a person truly saved, I mean, I profess with my mouth and believe in my heart, and it doesn't make any difference in the way I live my life, is the second version here. Okay? Jesus talks about when the seed is thrown, some of that seed sprouts off, but it doesn't last. Right? Because it's planted among weeds or it doesn't put down deep enough roots because of the rock. And when the drought comes, it dies. It sprouted. It really sprouted. But it never became what it was germinated to be. We need the roots. And the roots come by putting it into action. By obedience. The obedience of faith, Paul calls it. We saw it so many times. So when you say we're saved by faith alone, well, depends on what you mean. We're saved by grace alone through faith. But that faith is the obedience of faith. That's Faith in action, that's faith that's lived out. A faith that's in words only, James would say, is a lie, is dead. Jesus is, is putting a second to that right here. Oh, we have time for the centurion. When he come to the end, for all he wanted to hear the people, to, uh, hear the, he wanted the people to hear, he went back to Capernaum. Remember, he's living in Capernaum. Most of these other trips are like one or two day trips out, and he keeps coming back. He's in Galilee. Capernaum is his center of operation. So he comes back on the way there. There's a centurion. I told you, they kept a Roman garrison there, remember? Yes. Probably a hundred soldiers, which they called a century, and the leader of, of the, was, the commanding officer was the centurion. So this is an officer. The local people like this guy. Kind of rare. He's a Gentile, but they're going to like him. He says, a centur centurion there had a servant. A favorite of his who was sick and near death. Having heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him to ask him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, saying, He deserves this of you. This is unlike the Jewish attitude towards most Gentiles that we've encountered so far, right? So now this one, Jesus, nowadays they call them uh, righteous Gentiles. People that are sympathetic towards and supporters of Judaism, okay? This is an early righteous Gentile, I guess. He deserves this of you because he is well disposed towards our people and he built us our synagogue himself. He donated the money that built our synagogue. Okay. We like him. So don't, don't, don't cast him off as if they assumed Jesus would. So Jesus went with them. It was not very far from the house. The centurion sent word to him by some friends to say to him, Sir, do not put yourself to any trouble because I'm not worthy to have you enter under my roof. 
Those words familiar to you? I think it's very interesting. This Gentile who told Jesus, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. And I know it's probably going to provoke some problems for you too, probably. To come into the Roman section of the town and enter into my house. I think you might do it because I've seen you do some, I heard about you doing some outlandish things. Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm not worthy to have you here anyway. This man, this centurion, you know, leading officer of the garrison, says, I'm not, I'm not worthy. I recognize you as being something greater than me in his humility. And I just think it's ironic and interesting that Jesus rewarded this guy by having his line embedded into the mass. And has been, it has, he's been quoted by billions of people for thousands of years. That's kind of cool, isn't it? So, <laughs> I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. And that, is why, that is why I did not presume to come to you myself. Let my boy be cured by your giving the word. For I am under authority myself and have soldiers under me. And I say to one man, go, and he goes. To another, come here, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does it. In other words, just, I believe you have this kind of authority over this illness. Same kind of authority I have over my soldiers. He doesn't say how he thinks Jesus got this authority, but I recognize you have it. When Jesus heard these words, he was astonished at him, and turning around, said to the crowd following him, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found faith as great as this. And when the messengers got back to the house, they found the servant in perfect health. In another gospel story, a, gent a Gentile woman comes up and pleads that Jesus heals her daughter of a demon, remember? And he says, it's not right that I take from the children and give to with the dogs. And she says, well, even the dogs are allowed to eat the crumbs that fall from the table. And Jesus says, he was astounded. He says, in Israel, I don't see this kind of faith. Have what you ask for. You know, it kind of reminds me of that here. Well, we've just seen now the sixth miracle recorded in, in Luke. In the ever-expanding scope of Jesus demonstrating his authority. What has he done new here that he hasn't done before? First of all, the healing. From a distance. From a distance. Everyone else, he's been right there and even touched. All right, now Jesus is shooting that power way over there. And the person is being healed from a distance. Not only that, but we have a miracle now being done for the first time to a non-Jew. To a Gentile. There's going to be more to come. But this too is a sign. He's trying to demonstrate to them his ever-expanding authority. And now, he's also did it for a Gentile. The local people who like this guy, maybe they're okay with it. They asked Jesus to do it. I'm sure the mighty righteous Pharisees that had come up from Judea and saw this didn't like it. None. They were the hated Romans. They hated, well, the Romans, well, yeah, he was a hated Roman. Right, but the Pharisees didn't like him healing a Gentile. All right? So Jesus is still doing it. All right, he's pushing back the borders more and more and more, trying to get big enough that they finally say, only God can do this stuff. He's now gone beyond the borders of everything we've ever seen one of our prophets do. They've had prophets heal Gentiles. They've had prophets heal from a distance. But they had to be pretty great, great prophets. So he's now in that company of all stars. But none of those prophets claim to be God. All right? He's just tickling the edges of that one when he forgives sins, for instance, and does things on the Sabbath. But he hasn't quite gotten there yet. Okay? Thank you for playing with the microphones today. We're going to do better. I appreciate that very much. And for your great questions. Alright, we're all the way into chapter 7. We're doing alright. Let's, let's just stop right there for today. We'll say in our Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Today I'd say forgive us as we forgive others and give us the supernatural ability through grace to forgive all of them. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>